Hello friends, I am Dr. Krishna Prasad, I am a senior cardiothoracic surgeon at Medicover Hospitals. Today I want to talk on an important topic of diabetes. Many people have their own impression of what diabetes is, how to manage it, why is it a problem and uh, many people actually panic that once they are labeled as diabetic then it is for a lifetime and they should uh, they might get dependent on insulin. So there are lots of misconcepts and wrong understandings about diabetes. So in this video, I will try to explain what is diabetes, what is happening inside your body, how to tackle it and whether it is actually reversible or not. First and foremost, I would like to say that actually diabetes is reversible as against to what many people think and many diabetologists also would not probably share this information with you. But diabetes is reversible and it is entirely in our hands whether we can reverse it or not. Of course, it would mean some strict measures and change serious changes in your lifestyle and diet. But still, it is absolutely possible to come off medication in most patients and only very few will require uh, medication if we go by the strict measures. So let us come to understand what is diabetes. Diabetes is uh, a Latin term meaning just that your um, blood sugars are high. So diabetes mellitus is the full name of it. Mellitus means sugar and diabetes is the incidence of high blood sugar in your blood. Now let us understand why is this blood sugar increasing in the blood. Whenever we take food, food has, doesn't matter what food you eat, does, uh, it has few important components. We can divide the food into subtypes uh, as our body sees them. One is carbohydrates, that is all the sugars put together. Second is fats, third protein and fourth is minerals. So the, uh, any food you take has these components in various mixtures. So it could be leafy vegetables, it could be pulses, it could be rice, it could be any food that you are eating. It has these components. So the body looks at the food only in this component. And if you open any pack of food, uh, be it chips packet or anything, this subdivision is given at the back of the pack. The reason why they are giving it is for you to understand what you are consuming. Now, of the important things are the carbohydrate as far as diabetes is concerned. Carbohydrates are from the easiest way the body can um, get energy. So, that is the easiest food that the body can digest and make energy instantly. So, first and foremost comes glucose. And then there are lots of other sugars like uh, sucrose, fructose, fructose is then the fruits, sucrose is the sugar that we uh, have in tea and coffee and uh, there are maltose, galactose and lots of lactose. These are all different sugars that are present in different uh, food, uh, foods. Sugars don't exist not only as single uh, molecules but they come, across, come together and form complex molecules like um, starch. Starch is nothing but uh, a form of a chain of glucose uh, molecules forms starch. Similarly, all um, many plant uh, foods like rice, wheat and jowar, all of them have carbohydrate content in different forms, but usually they are chains of one or the other sugars. So when we take this food, the chains are broken and they are made into individual glucose molecules and then they just get into our bloodstream. So it is very important to, as a first step, identify the foods that have high carbohydrate content and foods that have high fat content and uh, foods that have high protein content. Once you know this, then you can modify your diet in such a way that if your requirement is of taking more protein, then you can take foods containing more protein or if you need high carbohydrates, then you can take high carbohydrates. So once we consume starch or uh, sugar, the sugar goes into the body, is broken down into uh, glucose molecules and the first place it goes is to liver. Now liver is like a traffic police. It 
kind of diverts the glucose to different organs, different places based on the requirements. Certain organs require only sugar and they cannot work with other uh, energy giving products. So like brain, heart and kidneys, they need only glucose. They can only work with glucose. They cannot work with anything else. So the liver takes the priority and sends most of these uh, sugars to the brain, um, heart and kidneys or rather what the, these organs do is they absorb the most of the sugars that come past them. Whereas other organs uh, like intestines or lungs or uh, skin and other, other uh, places, they are capable of using other uh, molecules like fats and proteins. Proteins only come as energy providers in extreme situations of starvation. So when we take food uh, and the other most important thing is the muscles. Muscles also, uh, muscle and liver have a mechanism of storing some of this sugar that comes to them and then they use it in case of an emergency. That's the reason why you find people who do exercise for a long time. They have more uh, uh, glycogen storages or the, this glucose storages in their uh, muscle and so they can run for a long time without getting tired because the glucose keeps coming all the time and muscle can use it. So um, now you should understand glucose is like the currency that the body uses from one place to the other uh, for it to produce energy. So if we are using oxygen glucose can produce uh, so called 38 ATP that is the energy units like it is like 38 dollars or 38 uh, rupees or 3800 rupees. These uh, can be used any, in any form of energy. So once uh, we consume food say our body needs about 1200 or 1500 calories and you have consumed 2000 calories of food that day. That 1500 calories will get used as per protein, our exercise and all. That excess 500 calories, what happens is that the body stores it for uh, adverse times. And the uh, mechanism of storage, as I said earlier, is by forming chains of glucose and putting it away either in liver or in muscle. If once that storage capacity also increases, then it starts storing sugar, changes it into fat and uh, start storing it as fat. So over a period of time on a daily basis, if you are taking 500 uh, calories extra, 500 calories extra, 500 calories extra, slowly we find that the fat content of the body keeps increasing. That's the reason why you know people always say when you eat excess you go fat. It doesn't happen overnight, it doesn't happen in a week or two, it, it happens over a slow process. But yes, if you keep consuming and don't use up that uh, sugars, then they form fat. Okay, fine. Let it form fat. People can become obese. So what's the big deal? What happens is, uh, you know, in one of the books I have read and I recommend this book to everyone who would like to know about diabetes is the book is called Diabetes Code by a Dr. Jason Fung. This book is available in, on Amazon and I would recommend you to read it to get a deeper understanding of uh, diabetes. In the book, uh, the doctor describes that, you know, this is like a mechanism of, say, you, if you have a dust in your bedroom and you're sweeping it in under the bed, you keep sweeping it under the bed and keep sweeping it daily after day after day after day, you keep this excess dust under the bed. After a period of time, the space in the under the bed is exhausted. It is full of dust and any more you uh, try to push in, it will start coming out at the other end because there is not enough space. Same thing happens with the fat tissue. When you keep consuming and consuming, we all have only X amount of fat cells and once those fat cells reach their capacity, the excess sugar starts spilling back into the blood and that's when people are, uh, become diabetic. So it's a simple process of eating excess carbohydrates, which over a period of time has saturated your storages. That means all the storage place in the body is saturated. And now what is happening is that the sugar is spilling out into the blood and it cannot, and body cannot handle it. So it's just hanging around. What happens if this blood sugar is high? Okay, fine, it's there what can happen. 
what people have noticed over centuries and this has been known for quite a while is that when blood sugar levels increase that causes uh, that changes the behavior of cells in each tissue and so diabetes affects every part of the body including the eyes brain blood vessels heart kidneys liver intestines legs arms you name it, that part is affected with diabetes. In the eyes, it can cause blockages of the blood vessels or what is called as a diabetic retinopathy, wherein the retina gets damaged and vision is uh, lost, or it can affect uh, the lens of your uh, uh, eye and people develop cataracts. Then it can develop blocks in the blood vessels supplying the brain and can cause paralytic attacks. Similarly, it can cause blocks in the blood vessels supplying the heart and can cause heart attacks. It can cause a direct damage to the kidneys and uh, precipitate kidney failure requiring dialysis. It can cause blocks in the blood vessels supplying the legs or arms and can cause uh, what we call as gangrene that is the tissue will get dead and uh, leads to sep sepsis and sometimes leading to amputation that is chopping off of uh, limbs. Uh, might result because of diabetes, wound healing will become poor because there is sugar in every tissue, small infection also will become excess and leads to cellulitis and all kinds of infections are a possibility. So diabetes is not something to take easy. It also affects autonomic nervous system that means there is a system in our body where some of the functions we don't think like the blinking of eyes, breathing and um, and the heartbeat, all these are dependent on autonomic nervous system. They're all happening automatically. Diabetes affects that as well. So it is a dangerous situation. How does diabetes cause damage? See, when the blood sugar levels increase and the excess uh, glucose is driven into the cells, the mechanism with which the glucose is driven into the cell is by uh, with the help of a molecule called insulin which is produced by the pancreas in the abdomen. Insulin ensures that the glucose is sent into the cell and the cell uh, uses it. But once, as we said earlier, that the capacity of all the cells is full and capacity of storage is full, then even insulin will not be able to push it into the cell because the cell has already got too much of glucose. So insulin will become less and less effective and that's the reason why we talk about the term called insulin resistance. So uh, there are two types of diabetes. One is juvenile diabetes that is that happens in kids uh, and young children or young adults and the other one is type 2 diabetes that is the one that happens in adults. In type 1 diabetes that is the juvenile diabetes the reason why they become diabetes is because they are unable to produce insulin. Whereas in type 2 diabetics, which happens in adults who are 35, 40 years of age, uh, it is happening because insulin has become ineffective. So as I was explaining earlier, why insulin has become ineffective is over a repeated period of time, over a prolonged period of time, we have been taking excess carbohydrates, which is present as excess sugar. And now insulin, despite its all its effort, it is unable to push the uh, sugar into the cell. It is like if a jail is uh, full of people and then you are trying to push more people, it can only accommodate some amount of people, it cannot accommodate all of them. So that is what is happening and so insulin will become ineffective. It is like the policeman trying to push the people into jail becomes ineffective. Similarly, insulin though it is present becomes ineffective. Once insulin becomes ineffective, the body tries to compensate by producing more and more insulin to see uh, if we can push the glucose. So one of the initial tests that we can do is a fasting insulin level before someone becomes a diabetic. Uh, the insulin, if the insulin levels are already high, then we know that this person might become diabetic and this can happen even before the blood sugar levels are increased. Equally, there are other tests like uh, if you do an ultrasound of the abdomen and if there is too much of fat in the liver, then that also kind of predicts before someone becomes diabetic that they can uh, become uh, diabetic in future. So we will talk about the testing uh, later but this is what is happening. So when the sugar levels in the uh, cell are high 
the sugar itself draws more water and the cell size increases. And when we are fasting, again the sugar comes out of the uh, cell and the water content becomes less, the cell shrinks. So this expansion and shrinking, expansion and shrinking happening over a period of time damages the cells, the lining of the blood vessels and that's what is supposed to cause the damage and starts of uh, these blocks that are causing the problems like heart attack or um, paralytic attacks. So whatever is uh, uh, happening with diabetes, it is not happening suddenly, it is happening over a period of time. So we need to act promptly, understand what our body is going through, understand what is the main problem here and then try to address it. The moment you start addressing it and reversing it, automatically all these damages also can be reversed. And in fact, most research now shows that some of these blockages also can be reversed if you, uh, you know, take proper lifestyle measures and follow strict dietary advice and exercise and uh, things like that. If you think about it, what has happened over the last 20-30 years is our exercise uh, um, levels have come down drastically with the onset of new automobiles, uh, new mobiles and more and more comforts. Nowadays even we have a remote to switch on the fan or just clap the hands and the lights come on. So we don't even want to get up from our chair uh, to the switch to switch on the light whereas our eating has not changed. We are in fact eating more and more, we eat more pizzas, burgers, we eat more, the variety of food has increased. So we have been eating more but not spending much. So obviously this is going to lead to the one major problem diabetes and that is what is happening world over. It is not only specific to any particular country or anything. In the 1970s and 80s it used to happen only in the United States but now it is a universal phenomenon. We as doctors even see laborers coming from poorer background also having diabetes at an early age of 35-40 years. So you can understand the magnitude of the problem. It is, it is, uh, and India has, uh, India and more so of uh, cities in India have become diabetic capitals. We are, we are having the maximum number of diabetic patients uh, as per population records. So it is high time we all have a good understanding and take measures. So that diabetes comes down and as I said earlier, diabetes is very much reversible. Now how do we treat uh, diabetes? Traditionally there are two types of uh, or three types of treating uh, diabetes. One is with tablets, second is with insulin. Among tablets there are two types. One is which enhances the uh, ability of uh, insulin, second is the one which increases the insulin production. So a tablet called metformin is actually one of the only tablets in diabetes that has been shown that it is actually beneficial to the patient who takes it and to the diabetic patients and reduces the risk of complications and that is metformin. But metformin is only useful in the initial stages when the blood sugars are uh, to a certain extent and it is not a universal uh, treatment. What metformin does is it increases the receptors where insulin can work. So it increases the efficiency of insulin and that's why it uh, reduces the blood uh, sugar levels. Whereas uh, other medicines called sulfonylureas, guanides and all those things, they uh, stimulate the pancreas to uh, produce more and more insulin. So that is in effect is like what the body has been trying to do all these days by increasing insulin. It is trying to push more and more glucose into the body whereas the main culprit is not the pancreas or lack of insulin production but the main culprit is us eating more sugars or carbohydrates in the diet. So this is the second form and then uh, with, if the sugars are not controlled with uh, these tablets over a period of time the pancreas will stop producing enough insulin and so uh, our insulin requirement goes up and patients end up being on artificial insulin which are again of multiple types, short acting insulins which act only for 4 to 6 hours, long acting insulins which uh, work for 8 to 12 hours and uh, so a combination of these two so that we can cover uh, both short term and long term and just twice a day injections and things like that. I don't want to go into the uh, exact uh, mechanisms of these uh, tablets and insulin because that's not the idea of this video. 
The idea of this video is to increase awareness, but it is very important to consult your diabetologist, take the proper medication and control the blood sugar levels. As I mentioned earlier, if the blood sugar levels keep fluctuating up and down, that causes more damage than either being them being high or low. And more importantly, it is very important to keep the sugar levels constant and within normal range. Now you may ask what is the normal range? The, and the normal range that we talk about now nowadays is the fasting sugar should be less than 130 um, and whereas the post lunch sugars should be less than 160. This is ideal. Even if it is less than 180 uh, also milligrams per 100 ml is fine. But very important to keep the sugar levels uh, under these numbers rather than uh, uh, allowing them to go uh, above these. One more investigation I would like to talk about is what is called as HbA1c that is hemoglobin A1c is a wonderful test. As I mentioned earlier, earlier the testing pattern used to be like you either measure the fasting glucose or post lunch sugars and then check that whether they are being controlled or not. But these tests only give a snapshot of how your sugar control is there on that particular day when you consume whatever food. So if you had excess carbohydrate, it might show your sugars are high. But if you did not uh, consume uh, excess uh, carbohydrates, then sugars might be low. But the next day when you eat sugar, the sugar might be high. So we, we do not get an exact picture with just uh, doing a fasting and a post lunch on just one particular day. HbA1c kind of records the sugars over a three month period of time. Why this happens is because the red blood cells that are there in the body have carry this uh, hemoglobin A1c and uh, RBCs do not multiply. So once they form, their lifespan is up to three months. And so they keep on recording whatever glucose levels that are there. If there is excess glucose that gets recorded and uh, low glucose levels are not recorded. So the, not much of glucose is attached to this hemoglobin. And so if you take a HbA1c level that gives a record of your sugar control over the last three months, which is a much better way of looking at uh, diabetic control and your HbA1c levels, if you are a diabetic should be less than 6.5. If you are not a diabetic, it should be less than 5.5 or uh, less than 6 at least uh, to call yourself as a non-diabetic. So if it is less than 6.5, then your uh, uh, sugar control is good. But if it is more than 6.5, then your sugar control is not good. So hemoglobin A1c is a better method of monitoring uh, blood sugars um, in terms of risk factors and also, but you should check it once in three months. HbA1c you should check uh, once in three months and for daily monitoring anyway fasting and post lunch uh, sugars are better and particularly these uh, fasting and post lunch sugars are better if you are taking insulin that would help you to decide on the dosage of insulin on a daily basis. This is traditional treatment and many uh, diabetologists may not even tell you that diabetes is reversible. But let us take a moment and uh, think about it as to how it started. I mentioned that the diabetes has, is because of excess carbohydrates. Now uh, recently and in the past also there was a lot of interest in uh, high protein high fat diet which is uh, again being propagated uh, nowadays as zero carb diets or protein diet and these uh, diets are extremely good in treating diabetes and obesity. Why does, why does that happen? They simply in these diets, they stop giving you any carbohydrates. So the only food components that you will have is fat and protein. So when there is no carbohydrate in the diet, then it is, there is no need for insulin in the body because there is no sugar to handle. And slowly what will happen, the sugar inside the cells that has been stored under the bed or that has been pushed into the cells, slowly it comes out, it gets consumed. And then the uh, body gets starved of sugar, it doesn't have sugar and it goes into what is called as a ketotic state. At the beginning of the video I mentioned that brain, heart and kidneys require only uh, sugars. So in the initial days of taking only fat and protein as a diet, many people will feel lightheaded or drowsy or weak for the first one week. That is because the brain is unable to get enough sugar. 
So, all the sugar in the body is being mobilized to supply to the brain and heart. So, but once uh, after a period of time, now the body adapts to the new situation. It knows that it is not going to get any sugar. And so, it goes into what is called as a ketotic uh, state, wherein the cycle of energy production starts somewhere in the middle. If you take glucose, say if it is uh, starting from step 1 to step 6 and then step 12, uh, and 6 is where keto acid comes, instead of going through 1 to 6 steps, the now the step will start at 6 and then 6 through 12. So, the energy production may not be as efficient, but still uh, the brain and heart and other tissues will start using the ketotic acids, which are uh, broken down parts of fat and uh, also um, the uh, protein can be converted into part sugars that can be used uh, uh, for this method. So, the if you go on zero carb diet over a short period of time, you get into a ketotic state and then your energy comes back and then you start mobilizing the fat in the body and you start using up the excess fat. And uh, in this situation, that's why people lose weight despite eating more fat you lose fat. So, that is the uh, secret behind it. But studies have also shown that if you continue to use this for a long time, that is not good for your heart or for your body. If you think about it, nature has put carbohydrates in our diet for a reason because we are supposed to consume some amount of carbohydrates. What we have done is we have started consuming excess carbohydrates and that is why we ended up in problem. So, the solution is simple that if you are a diabetic and if you want to control it and if you want to come off your medication, then the one and the foremost principle is consume less carbohydrates. I am not going to say zero carbohydrates, but start consuming less carbohydrates. Now, here I would like to introduce another uh, uh, topic or another concept called glycemic index. What is glycemic index? Glycemic index is uh, when we eat food, the rate at which it releases glucose is called glycemic index. So, foods that are high in glycemic index release sugar all of a sudden like a burst, whereas foods that are low in glycemic index release sugar very slowly. So, it has got nothing to do with the amount of sugar that is there in the food, but the speed at which it is released. So, all processed food like maida, anything that is made of maida like pizzas, burgers, breads, white bread, and even I would go on to say rice, polished rice, nowadays wheat and white jowar. All of these have been processed, even rice. We have uh, polished this nicely so that we have taken away all the husk, all the vitamins, all the fiber to make it look nice and white. The more white a rice is, it is as good as eating sugar itself. So, you might as well eat a, a spoon of sugar rather than eat rice. And that's the reason why in a rice consuming society like ours, the incidence of diabetes is on the rice, more so in southern India because we consume more rice in uh, south India. So, we need to identify foods that have got high glycemic index and foods that have got low glycemic index. And then foods that have high glycemic index predispose to uh, diabetes and also makes diabetics worse. Imagine if your body can produce 10 units of insulin which can handle 100 grams of sugar in one hour time. If you eat rice which gives 500 grams of sugar in the first one hour, where is the body? It cannot produce, it can only produce 10 units of uh, insulin. So, this excess 400 um, uh, grams of carbohydrate that you have consumed is going to be there in your system and either you give tablets or insulin to handle that. Why do that? Rather than that, if you take only 50 grams of uh, carbohydrate that is rice, reduce the rice quantity, your body is producing 10 units which can handle 100 uh, grams of uh, sugar, you have taken only 50 grams. So, it is happy, your sugar levels will not increase. So, that is the key. The first and foremost is to identify the foods that have high glycemic index and foods that have got low glycemic index. Foods as I said have high glycemic index are all processed foods. In any form it, it has been processed means it can have high carbohydrate content. So, the chips, potatoes, um, any snacks that you can think of, anything um, which is white in color in food and um, 
लाइक वाइट ब्रेड राइस वीट जोआर इवन वीट फ्लावर विच इज गॉट नो फाइबर सो ऑल दीज इवन वर्मसेली एंड थिंग्स लाइक दैट स्पेगेटी पास्ता विच आर वाइट इन कलर ऑल दीज थिंग्स हैव हाई ग्लाइसिमिक कंटेंट ग्लाइसिमिक इंडेक्स and they have high sugar content as well so here again a observation if you eat white rice it gets digested fast and you feel hungry within an hour's time and you would like to eat more that is again bad you are adding more and more carbohydrate uh, content to the body so here comes the second concept of intermittent fasting that means we are giving the body some time for it to regain its insulin levels Give, as the, per the previous example, if it is able to produce 10 units of insulin per hour, if you eat five, uh, you know, 500 grams uh, now and then give it two hours and then eat another 100 grams or another two hours and something else. So if you keep on eating at regular intervals, then the body will never have time to produce enough insulin to handle the food that you are eating. So that is the reason why what we have found out is with this intermittent fasting, which can be done in multi multitude of ways. Most convenient way is to give a 16 hours gap between meals and have only two meals in a day. So have your dinner at eight o'clock in the night, and then do not eat anything till 12 o'clock next day afternoon. So that gives a good 16 hours gap for your body, no carbohydrates. so the body recovers and all this 10th and units of insulin that it is producing is stored and kept ready for use when you have your meal at 12 o'clock and then your sugar levels will be handled easily by your body the other way of doing intermittent fasting is do a 24 hour fast in a week's time or uh, complete two or three days fasting in a month so it it is your choice and how you would like to do uh, it your way so if you are doing a 24 hour fasting you have your dinner today at 7 o'clock do not eat anything uh, till the next day uh, 7 o'clock so that gives a 24 hours time for the, your body to recuperate if you do it once in a week also that is fine because what you have done in effect is you have averaged the reduced the amount of carbohydrate that your body is requiring uh, or need to handle over a week week period so slowly the pancreas will recover insulin will recover and less and less insulin is required to handle the carbohydrate load that is being put on the body so the second thing is uh, intermittent fasting the first step was to eat foods that are low in uh, glycemic index second step is intermittent fasting and the third step is exercise so whatever sugars that you are eating you need to exercise enough for them to be used up so that there is space for more glucose and uh, exercise need not be running jogging or active exercise till you sweat but most importantly spend it so people who are aged who are unable to run go for a walk walk as much as you can whatever exercise that permits if your knees are hurting then do a static cycle in some way expend the energy in some way expend the food that you have eaten so that balance should be brought about and you should match the amount of calories eaten to the calories burnt how you do it it is entirely up to you you can discuss with your physiotherapist given your body condition given your clinical condition which is the best exercise you decide but ultimately you need to consume uh, sorry you should you need to spend as much energy as much as you are consuming so once this balance is brought with these three steps i can promise you you can come off your diabetic medication so diabetes is very much reversible it is not uh, that uh, you know I'm, um, i'm just guessing this but there are umpteen number of um, websites uh, umpteen number of uh, internet information that is there for you to check and confirm this you might say some of these things are very difficult see obviously when you are eating low glycemic food when you uh, ask me what is a low glycemic food one of the most prominent thing is millets nowadays we get all kinds of millets like the ragi ragi is a millet which can be ground and can be used as flour along with uh, wheat uh, there are other millets like kodo millet foxtail millet little millet barnyard millet so there are a empty number of millets that are there quinoa is again a superfood that is being uh, sold all these millets 
they have almost the same uh, carbohydrate content as rice but the way they uh, release uh, glucose is a very very slow process and the body has to expend some more energy in order to digest this food they are hard foods so if you take a millet uh, meal then you are not feeling hungry for the next 4 to 6 hours because the body is still trying to digest that food your carbohydrate is being released slowly and the insulin that the body is producing is able to have handle this little bit carbohydrate that is being added to the uh, load and so intermittent fasting also will become easier because you are not feeling hungry uh, in between your meals. So uh, millets is one uh, uh, good food that I would suggest. Then other things like brown rice, unhusked rice and uh, anything that has got a lot of fiber is the other thing that can um, reduce the glycemic index. The other important component of food is uh, pulses. Pulses are full of fat and protein so and their carbohydrate content is less. So you can consume more pulses, uh, fresh vegetables, most vegetables that we eat, not the roots and tubers that grow under the ground. Any storage vegetable has got high carbohydrate content. I am talking about green vegetables that grow on top of the soil and uh, which are green in color and which are as fruits or as um, as flowers or leaves or whatever. So green leafy vegetables, uh, green vegetables which have got nice water content. They are very low in carbohydrate content. And so in, in, in your meal, you can eat more of your curry, more of your dal, more of uh, more component of these and less component of rice or uh, the millet. So your carbohydrate content is reduced, but still you would feel uh, full. Because again, it's a better combination with millets, the taste uh, tends to be minimized because you don't feel the same taste as rice because rice enhances the uh, taste of curries and dal. Whereas with millets and brown rice, the taste is underplayed. So you need to eat more dal, more uh, curries, which is good because they don't have enough uh, that much of carbohydrates and but they are adding to the fiber content and makes you feel uh, full at the end of the uh, meal and you're not uh, ending up being hungry. So that's a very good uh, way of dealing with uh, this problem. Many people find it very difficult with the intermittent fasting that for 16 hours, if you are having to uh, not eat anything is very difficult. So what I would suggest is if you are a person who usually takes breakfast, stop taking breakfast and instead of breakfast, you can eat uh, zero carb uh, foods like salads, cucumber salad or lettuce or uh, sprouts uh, of uh, moong dal or uh, chickpeas, uh, eat sprouts and you can have uh, lemon juice with a pinch of salt. So avoid taking anything with sugar, even I would go to the extent of saying that if you are a coffee drinker, take black coffee minus the milk and sugar, even milk has got lactose which has got a sugar. So give your body a complete rest for 16 hours and you will see the difference. Most important thing that you should see when you start this intermittent fasting and all these measures is that your stomach uh, size, the waist size should come down. Because we Indians are called, uh, you know, uh, we are called thin uh, obese diabetics or, you know, we have what is called as a trunkal obesity. So we are thin all over, uh, limbs and all are thin, but all the fat is uh, around the waist, around our uh, tummy. And that is because the fat cells are only preserved there, the rest of the body there aren't enough fat cells. So the, all the fat gets uh, uh, deposited uh, uh, in and around the abdominal wall and more uh, importantly around the abdominal organs. So one of the most important things that you should see when you start uh, doing all these measures is your waist uh, should, uh, should start coming down, your pants should become loose, you should be losing weight around your waist. Once that is happening, you know you are on the positive side and you will automatically find that your blood sugars are getting better and you will need less and less medication to control your sugars. So that is a, one of the best signs that you can see that if your waist circumference is coming down, then that is a good sign. Again, waist circumference has been shown as a risk factor. Increased waist circumference has been shown as a risk factor for heart disease, paralytic attacks, you name it, all the uh, diseases that happen, including cancers, 
can happen because of increased waste ratio. So once it is coming down, then uh, you know that you are on the right path. And recent, uh, one of the recent Nobel Prizes has been given to Japanese scientists who have shown that intermittent fasting is actually beneficial and prevents cancer. That is because during intermittent fasting, dead cells and cells that are not good enough are killed and they die through a process called apoptosis. And this apoptosis helps body to re, uh, rejuvenate and uh, get rid of all the bad cells. And so the incidence of cancer has also been shown to uh, improve with intermittent fasting. So this concept of intermittent fasting has definitely uh, caught up and you can read more about it on the internet and then follow it uh, safely. As per exercise, as I said, do as much as you can. And again, uh, you, uh, common sense should prevail. Do not overdo things and always take expert advice of a physiotherapist or your doctor or any uh, nowadays trainers are there who are very much into these things and they can help you formulate an exercise that does not put strain on all your, your existing problems but at the same time allows you to expend more uh, energy. And as you uh, progress along these lines, you will find that your blood sugar levels uh, keep coming down and diabetes gets better. In fact, you can also reverse the blocks that are there in your heart vessels and I will cover that in a totally different uh, topic on uh, how to manage yourself uh, lifestyle. A word about uh, particularly post-operative uh, diabetes. People who have been diabetic or borderline diabetic before the operation, following a heart operation, their sugars tend to be higher for the first, first four to six weeks after the operation. And this is more so because uh, it is the body's reaction. All the uh, hormones that work against insulin are increased. Again, it's a body's response because it wants to provide more glucose, more energy for the healing process as well. So the sugars tend to be elevated for the first four to six weeks, that is a month and a month and a half. So you need to take extra care during this time. If need be, go on insulin or extra medication to control the sugars and uh, follow all the regimes I have told, intermittent fasting, exercise and uh, reducing the carbohydrate content, eating more fresh fr uh, fruits and vegetables and fresh uh, vegetables instead, uh, which have got um, less uh, carbohydrate component at least for the four to six weeks. And once you recover enough and once your sugars come back to your normal levels, you can get back to your normal dietary pattern. It is important that sugars are controlled around the time of operation because that determines whether your bypass grafts are working well, whether your wounds are healing well and uh, exercise also helps in improving your appetite, makes you feel hungry, makes you feel tired and sleep well in the night. And it also helps the heart operation because when you exercise, your heart rate increases and more blood fill, flow through these bypass grafts and it keeps them open. For, uh, and so it is all plus, plus, plus if you do more, uh, if you keep yourself active. But again, um, the common sense should prevail. Do not overdo things. Understand what is happening and uh, know exactly what is the problem with you and address it so that we can all overcome. In the post-operative period after your heart operation, it is very important to monitor your sugars as well. So uh, you, uh, you buy yourself this sugar measuring uh, machine, which doesn't cost, cost them a thousand, two thousand rupees. Check your sugars fasting, that is uh, as soon as you get up in the morning and post lunch, that is two hours after lunch and before dinner and make a note of them every day so that uh, you, when you go to your diabetologist or when you go back to your cardiac surgeon, you can show them and accordingly they will know how well your sugars are controlled and how uh, the, your medication can be uh, modified. If you are taking insulin and you are, if you are monitoring sugars, it will become easy for you to uh, know and how to manage your sugars. Because if you are taking a long term insulin like a mixed start, then uh, if your fasting sugars are high, that means your early morning sugars are high, you need to increase the dose in the night. And if your nighttime sugars are high, you need to increase the day to, uh, early morning insulin dosage. So again, it becomes easy if you understand what is happening and for us to monitor it as well, always make it a point to note down your sugar levels, the time, date, time 
and what state you are in fasting post lunch whatever and then uh, record your uh, uh, sugar levels so that it becomes easy for your doctor to manage your diabetes so in conclusion i would only say one thing diabetes is reversible it is entirely up to us how we handle it and how we overcome it and for further details you can visit the website or my website or uh, you can check it up with this book called diabetes code thank you